Hi, everyone. My name is Bill Daniels, and I'm the program leader for Native Seed Communities, which is a project of the Indiana Native Plant Society. We're very glad you're here uh, and joined us for Mary Wells' presentation, Milkweeds and Milk Jugs, Growing Native Plants for Everyone. Uh, before I introduce Mary, though, I'd like to share with you some information about Native Seed Communities. We promote networks of native plant enthusiasts working together to regionally procure, to process, and propagate native plant seeds, um, and with the whole purpose of increasing the presence of these beautiful and ecologically appropriate native plants in all of our landscapes. Our presentations, like tonight, are devoted to discussing the propagation of native plants from seeds and the spotlighting of community organizations and individuals that use these seed grown plants to increase um, th those plants in all of our landscapes. Uh, we have a lot of resources on the web and social media that we'll be sharing the links in the chat for you all. A final note, a few notes anyway, uh, for the best experience for everyone, if you would please keep yourself muted, unless of course you're asked to unmute. Uh, also, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Deb Hausen, who uh, is here helping with the technical aspects and also the questions, will field them for us. Um, Mary has said it's okay for her to be interrupted during the presentation if it's a good time to do so and uh, and ask questions. So, so please go ahead and feed them into the chat as you have them. We'll also most likely have some time at the end for some questions too. All right. We'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce Mary. Mary Wells is the Education Director for Sycamore Land Trust. And this is where I especially know Mary. Um, some of you know me. I uh, help out at, as a volunteer with the Sycamore Land Trust Native Plant Nursery. And Mary's on the staff there and one of the key staff that, that helps keep us, um, keep us going and everything. So much appreciate. Mary and all that she does in that in that role, but she does other things. Uh, she's the chair of the city of of uh, Bloomington's uh, Indiana Tree Commission, uh, uh, Bloomington, Indiana's Tree Commission, member and past treasurer of Monroe County. Identify and reduce invasive species, known as MC Iris. For many of you that may know that name better than the the full long name. Um, and board member of the Indiana Native Plant Society. Or over the course of her career in conservation, she has worked in environmental education, invasive species management, digital media communications, office administration, and the native plant nursery trade. She studied biology at Indiana Univers University and plant pathology at the University of Georgia in Athens. Mary is, a, is dedicated to the protection of native biodiversity and helping others experience and connect with the natural world. In her free time, although quite limited, Mary enjoys landscaping with native plants, wrangling invasive plants, nature illustration, and opportunities to learn more about the natural world. I present to you, Mary Wells. Thank you, Bill. Um... Yeah. That was very sweet. Um, it's going to take me a minute to get my screen up. So one moment. Thank you. Everybody. Um, so this is a, a presentation that I'm excited to do. I, I've um, it's a presentation for anyone that's already interested in sowing plants from seed, uh, and specifically for helping people um, that want to spread the word and involve more people in their projects. So if you have a group that you're interested in sowing with. It's going to be a really great resource to help you um, learn how to troubleshoot some of the issues and um, work with a large group to help them sow native seed. But also, it'll be for people that are just getting started as well. So, um, so I'm excited to share some of my experiences with you all. Uh, so moving on. So, just to give you an overview, uh, for those of you that are new to Sycamore, I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those of you that are new to Sycamore Land Trust, I'll give you a quick introduction about the organization I work for. Uh, talk about the importance of native plants, just to make sure we're all kind of on the same page. 
discuss milkweeds in particular and their benefits for monarch butterflies, and then get into the details. I like details about um, easy to grow native plants uh, that I use for my programming, uh, and then go through the step-by-step -step process with lots of tips on how to do this with various groups of people. Uh, I'll highlight some accomplishments and uh, share with you a lesson learned uh, and then provide some resources for continuing education if there's time. I have quite a few slides, so uh, bear with me, but if there's a question that I can answer in the middle, I'm happy to do so. So uh, to talk a little bit about Sycamore Land Trust, uh, our mission is to preserve the beauty, oops, I'm gonna move, uh, there we go, preserve the beauty, health and diversity of Southern Indiana's natural landscapes through land conservation and environmental education. And, um, sorry, making sure I click through. So we, we were founded in 1990 and we cover a 26 county re region in central or so, south central Indiana. We're based in Bloomington. Um, we protect over 100 uh, pieces of property totaling of over 11,000 acres. Um, our work is powered by our wonderful membership and numerous volunteers, and we maintain about 30 miles of hiking trails on 13 public preserves, which I encourage you to visit if you haven't already. Um, we preserve land. So this is an aerial photo of our iconic Bean Blossom Bottoms Nature Preserve. That was uh, bottom land agriculture um, farmland before we acquired it. And this is an aerial photo um, not too many years ago uh, showing that nature has come back. We protect biodiversity at our preserves. Um, we, our preserves are home to many rare threatened and endangered species, uh, especially at our wetland preserves like bean blossom bottoms. These are just a few of the many species that are, depend on this habitat including beautiful purple fringeless orchid, Henslow sparrow, the Indiana bat, Virginia rail, the bald eagle, which is a success story, Kirkland snake, a state endangered snake, a new species of discovered firefly, the cypress firefly, American bittern, and many more. We also do uh, take care of a lot of habitat restoration. So when we acquire land, we restore it based on what is most suitable. So an example here is um, taking land out of agriculture and, and putting it into a, a wildflower meadow restoration. Uh, we also do tree plantings and various wetland restoration work. Uh, in addition to protecting land and restoring habitat, uh, our trails are a wonderful way to get connected with our preserves and with nature. And we have been involving volunteers for various work, including land stewardship, uh, invasive species removal, you name it. Uh, this is an example of pulling garlic mustard for years on end at the Amy Weingartner Brannigan Peninsula Preserve. Uh, we have a hillside of garlic mustard converted into a hillside of native Virginia bluebell um, after our work. And then I'll touch on this in more detail, but this is what Bill mentioned for those of you that came early, that he's been involved with our native plant nursery. So we've, we're volunteer powered. Our amazing volunteers are helping us grow thousands of native plants each year for restoration, as well as for a fundraising event plant sale that we have once a year now. And we have some amazing online resources. I would be uh, remiss if I did not mention our wildlife camera project. We have trail cam set up throughout our preserves where you get a wonderful behind the scenes sneak peek at all the critters that, that make our preserves home. And you get to see them not just once, but um, just kind of living their lives throughout the seasons and growing up and raising their families. So it's definitely worth watching. Also online, we have a webinar virtual lecture series called Conservation Conversations, where we speak with uh, local authors or local experts and authors. And uh, there's some really great conversations recorded, just like we're recording this one here. I encourage you to watch the recordings or tune in to our next uh, conversation. And then where I come in, our environmental education program uh, reaches thousands of people of all ages. Um, through various guided hikes and various nature-based programming. 
And um, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is our native plant project, creating habitat at schools and other green spaces. Uh, so we do tree plantings, rain gardens, and other types of pollinator plantings to provide habitat. And what we're going to be talking about today are milkweeds and milk jugs program. So growing native plants from seed. And I'm, um, I'm excited to share the, my experiences with you. To begin, I love this quote, and it really summarizes how I feel about what I'm doing. Uh, and I'll just showcase that I'm including a photo, uh, illustration of common milkweed that I did a little bit ago. Uh, this quote by Lady Bird Johnson, our former first lady, who was the co-founder of the National Wildlife Research Center in 1982, uh, which was later officially renamed after her the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in 1997. And they have a great um, website and online resources. So um, I won't read this quote, but um, it just really hits home the um, how I feel about our native plant communities and sharing those with other people. Uh, and then I have some of my little illustrations to share. <laughs> uh, so we know our monarchs use our milkweeds, but other animals do too, like this beautiful ruby-throated hummingbird. So to begin, we'll make sure we're all on the same page to define a native species. I've been using this quote for a while now, and I, I really think it summarizes the concept of nativity. So a native species is an organism that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. It's a nice open-ended statement. Um, it's in a book called The Living Landscape written by Richard Dark and Doug Tallamy. Uh, this is a photo of a white oak. Um, we'll talk about the keystone species, but they it is the keystone of keystone species here in the Midwest. Um, we have a, a picture of a polyphemus moth I found over at RCA Park in my neighborhood at the end of a, a year, a couple years ago. And I got curious and found that this moth uses oaks as its food source when it's a caterpillar. Uh, and then without oaks, we might not have this beautiful adult silk moth. So just how connected everything is. Uh, we know that habitat is home. Uh, we, just, we learn more and more how diverse native plant communities are the basis of local food webs and support the natural resources on which all life depends. And that includes us. We are learning, or we have learned, that there are about 90% of insects that eat plants, so that's herbivorous insects, can only use the native plants with which they are evolved. So they need plants that are native. We know also that 96% of birds in North America rear their young on insects. And uh, we know that especially caterpillars are great insect food or baby bird food. Uh, we also know that keystone native plants are going to be supporting a higher level of biodiversity of insects than other types of um, other types of plants. Uh, so I just want to just a shout out. I'm sure many of you have already heard of Doug Tallamy, but his research has set the stage for an, our understanding of keystone plants. Uh, his his work and his research team at the University of Delaware has revealed that 14% of our native flora or plants support a vast majority of the butterfly and moth uh, species, especially the caterpillar larva, um, collectively known as Lepidoptera. So 90% um, of those types of insects use only 14% of the plants that we have here. So we can take that information and make a lot of decisions around it. And that also influences the species that I've selected to grow with various groups. Uh, the Native or the National Wildlife Federation has compiled this and other data and offers a really great online resource that I would like to point out called the Keystone Plants by Ecoregion. So if you're curious about what kind of um, keystone flora you can grow, I recommend checking out that resource. And this is just kind of a summary of the herbaceous plants since I pretty much, unlike Ray and other folks, I'm only growing herbaceous plants with groups. Um, so we, 
I just take this information into consideration when I'm selecting species to grow along with other criteria. So going into the milkweed monarch situation that we are so concerned about, our monarch butterfly, as we know, is one of those really uh, selective species that requires um, milkweeds as a food source for its caterpillars. Monarchs uh, and their populations have declined um, pretty drastically. Uh, we're seeing about 90%, if not greater, declines in a period of 20 years. And as we know, without milkweeds, there would be no monarch butterflies. There are other factors involving the decline of monarchs, but there are some farming practices and various development, human development has caused a decline in milkweed availability. So just to bring it home, I just like to talk about the monarch life cycle here in Indiana uh, and just put that into our heads as to help us have perspective. Um, monarchs arrive here beginning in May and lay their eggs. Um, those eggs only take about three to five days to hatch depending on when, where, when they're ready to hatch. Uh, the caterpillar grows uh, through five life stages called instars, sheds its skin in between each and grows larger each time. And at the end of that fifth instar, it kind of latches on to something to secure itself, a leaf or a structure, and forms its chrysalis where it undergoes metamorphosis. It takes it out another 10 to 14 days for that uh, adult to emerge as a adult butterfly from the chrysalis, dries off its wings uh, to mate and reproduce that particular adult. If it's uh, the first few generations only lives to be about um, two to five weeks old. Um, but then later generations migrate south and may live up to six to eight months. So here in Indiana, this is just kind of the summary of the timeline. I think it's really interesting to think about this. So coming in May, we have generation one adults, which are literally the children of the migratory monarchs that overwintered in Mexico and Southern United States. Uh, and the eggs are laid by this generation around May to June. I will say that last year we had a uh, odd weather spell where we got um, some monarchs and uh, caterpillars a little bit early. I think as early as April, but typically May is when we can expect them. Uh, and then from those eggs laid, we get a generation two caterpillars from June to July. Um, they also mate and lay their eggs in uh, late August. Um, we may also get generation two adults that um, were born south of Indiana and come up to Indiana to mate and lay their eggs to reproduce. Um, and then from there, we have generation three and four, and they kind of overlap. And the earlier cohort of generation three usually have time to mate, reproduce, um, and complete their life cycle, and they would not necessarily migrate. But it is generation three, the later half of generation three, and most of generation four that are going to emerge at the end of the year and migrate south to overwinter and complete the cycle and the journey north. So milkweeds are a very interesting group of plants and there's a lot of um, criteria that make it a milkweed. We have over a hundred species of milkweed that are native to North America and 15 of which are here in Indiana. Uh, and many, if not all are used by monarchs as larval or caterpillar food. Um, they're in the family Asclepiaceae, genus Asclepius for the most part. Most, if not all, contain milky sap or latex, and they contain toxic cardinalide alkaloids, which will be protecting the caterpillars and potentially the adults from predators. They have a unique flower structure, which defines them, and pollination adaptation. So I won't go into too much detail because we do have limited time but they are a five-parted flower. They have five um, sepals below, or um, petals, I'm sorry. And then these upright hood-like structure, often with these neat horns within them. And then they have a, a fused male and female um, kind of center part. And then a really interesting mechanism for pollen extraction from the half anthers. Uh, we won't go into too much detail. 
But another defining factor of a milkweed is its seed or fruit. Um, the follicle is a pod-like fruit that splits along a single seam when mature. And that coma, also known as pappus or floss, is that white silky fluff that helps with wind dispersal of milkweed seed. And uh, each pod may contain dozens to hundreds of those flat brown kind of leathery seeds within. And I narrowed down the native milkweeds to four, which I would consider relatively easy to grow that are um, good for growing here in Indiana. Um, amongst the other criteria is that they are good for monarch butterflies to use as a food source. Also that they make really good pollinator plants for other insects. So they support various bees, wasps, butterflies, and other um, animals or other insects will use them as a food source as well. So we have marsh milkweed, common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and world milkweed. And I'll just help you um, orient yourself. I'm organizing species by their species name. So um, alphabetically, if that's helpful. So marsh milkweed uh, is a milkweed that is gonna like wet sites, though it can grow pretty well in regular garden soil as long as it's not too dry. Uh, and this one's very easy to grow. And it has these kind of lance-like shaped leaves that are particularly succulent all year long. So this is a really great one to support monarch caterpillars throughout the growing season. And of course, it's not just supporting caterpillars. We know that a lot of bees are pollinators of this plant. And I just put this symbol here indicating the caterpillar is going to use that as a food source. Common milkweed, which is probably the most iconic of the milkweeds, uh, is, is a one that I would recommend to grow. Um, it's a little more difficult. It's not the first one I grow with groups, um, but it is a really great one to add to your landscape. Uh, very fragrant flowers. It can be a little aggressive, so it's the best in places where it can be let, left to spread easily. Moving on to the most showy of the native milkweeds that you would want to grow, which is butterfly milkweed. Um, fairly easy to grow from seed, though transplanting can be uh, a challenge. It's a, it doesn't like its roots disturbed at some stages, but it's fairly adaptable and has these really showy flowers. And moving on to world milkweed, this one's kind of a unique milkweed with very narrow leaves and um, kind of short stature and can really thrive in tough sites. So it's a good one to consider if you've got a, a rock garden or just a really dry area. This one is toxic to grazers, so you wanna make sure it's not planted anywhere near where you might have livestock. So there are some other native plants that are easy to grow that I use and would recommend. Um, oh, some of those got left off. Um, and the other criteria for these is not just that they're easy to grow, but they might be keystone species or they might be make really good ornamentals that are lasting in a landscape um, and may not need as much care as some other natives would require. And that list does consider whether or not they're keystone species or not. So I've indicated with uh, this symbol if it is considered a keystone by based on those criteria we talked about earlier. So we have nodding wild onion, uh, which is easy to grow and very adaptable and does support a diversity of insects and other wildlife. Uh, this one is getting the deer and rabbits avoidance symbol. So that is a good thing. Unfortunately, we have a lot of deer that can negatively affect some of our pollinator plantings. So uh, another great one. Oh, that's funny. I neglected to change the, the species name on this. This is purple giant hyssop. I apologize. <laughs> so um, it is that nodding, not nodding wild onion. So I will fix that at a later time, but it is in the mint family. Uh, it is also somewhat deer and rabbit avoided. 
uh, and a pollinator magnet. And it blooms for a long time. Uh, I use this one, uh, I like this one for schools because it has a long bloom time and does overlap with the school year. Another easy to grow native, Landsleaf coreopsis, uh, is a great one to consider adding. It is also typically, it is considered a keystone and typically avoided by deer. I won't go into excessive detail on these species because um, I, I want to get to the steps step by step for the most benefit here. But I just want to make sure to touch on some ones that I would recommend you consider growing either with yourself or with groups that you're working with. Uh, this one does have an early bloom period, which overlaps with the school year, which makes it beneficial to consider for growing with schools. And then the iconic native purple cone flower. Um, it's kind of everybody's introduction to native plants. And while it's not typically found uh, in the wild, it is a really great landscape plant. Uh, this one kind of is avoided by deer, but not necessarily something you can count upon. So I kind of grade that out a little bit. And uh, it is one that is popular with monarch butterflies as a nectar plant. So, so a reason to add it for sure. Uh, we have another plant in the mint family, the wild bergamot, which is easy to grow and supports a diversity of insects and other um, various pollinators has a really neat seed head that kind of overwinters, like a, it's like a salt shaker seed head. And the deer are going to typically avoid this and also may be visited by monarch butterfly adults. Also growing smooth beard tongue is a great one to consider. Uh, it is a fairly early plant, though usually it won't bloom until after the school year is out. It's especially popular with various types of bees. And this is another one where you're gonna have deer avoiding that plant. Another mint family plant, Slender Mountain Mint, easy to grow and a really great plant, a long bloom time, very ornamental and very adaptable. So, um, and, and these plants that are in the mint family also make additions to uh, sensory gardens, if you're considering doing something like that at your school or other um, green space. And because it is in that mint family, it's typically avoided by deer and other herbivores. A new plant for me this year that I fell in love with is Sweet Susan, uh, one of our Black-Eyed Susan um, Rudbeckia species. I have decided to grow this one this year. Um, it should be fairly easy to grow from seed. It's very adaptable and really does persist on the landscape and it supports quite a bit of um, insect life. So I've got that as a keystone species to add and it does have, um, it's also known as um, sweet coneflower or fragrant coneflower. It has very pungent, um, smelling uh, foliage, so it's not typically browsed by herbivores, and visited potentially by our monarch butterfly adults. I would be remiss if I didn't encourage at least one grass as a, a opportunity for growing with various groups. And so I typically promote growing little blue stem as an addition to various pollinator plantings. Uh, it does support various butterfly and moth um, caterpillars as well as a diversity of other insects. And then our grasses are not typically browsed by deer and rabbits. And it's great for various types of sites and mass plantings. And we have another keystone species to consider growing, Solidago, um, I'm sorry, showy goldenrod, one of our Solidago species. And we know from that list that our goldenrods are going to be supporting the most amount of caterpillar diversity. So this one is the most um, landscape friendly of the goldenrods. So I would encourage considering this one to grow. It is fairly easy to grow. Um, so it's a definitely one to consider. It is typically not browsed by deer. Um, based on some compounds in the leaves, but there's always no guarantees for that. And then because this is a late bloomer, it's overlapping with the school year and would be a popular um, food source for adult butterfly um, 
monarch butterflies as they're getting ready to migrate south or ending their year. And I kind of waffled uh, for a couple of years on which aster I wanted to grow and I've settled back on New England aster. Um, it's the showiest uh, and has a really nice late bloom time, easy to grow and really does persist on the landscape. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it is considered a keystone species, but sometimes deer may eat, eat on it. Um, and so it is one where it may need a little bit of protection, but I picked it most of all for its um, support of our monarch butterflies and other pollinators. All right, so I kind of blazed through those plants because I knew I wasn't gonna have much time if I wanted to get through my step-by-step -step process. So um, there's some tips that I wanna share and um, some of it may be repeat information for those of you that have watched some of the other Indiana Native Seed Community videos, but I'll try to make it as productive as possible. So I've been working for the last two, two and a half years with various groups to grow native plants from seed, um, anywhere from lower elementary to middle school and some adult groups. Um, so I have, I've, I've kind of run the gamut of various situations and can troubleshoot anything along the way. I did produce a step-by-step -step guide, which if anyone's interested, you're welcome to email me and I can send you a PDF version of this that um, kind of strips it down to the bare bones. But um, that also appeared in our twig publication last spring. Um, so moving on, and this is going to be repeat for some of you, but I, I think it's all important information for anyone that's coming to this from a new perspective. It is important to obtain seed from a reliable source. Um, I will share some firsthand experience on um, what happens if that, if something breaks down in that system. I, as we say in the um, Indiana Native Seed Community Group, Local seed sources are important if you can do them. I'm very excited to say that I collected about two thirds of the seed that I'll be growing locally this year. So um, a positive outcome to a uh, lesson learned. Uh, and then always, always confirm your species by its scientific name. Make sure that who you're who you're getting the seed from, whether you're purchasing it or it's a seed swap, make sure you know that species name. Um, that its scientific name is included. I recommend if you're buying them to look at some of the sources at the Indiana Native Plant Society's by Native Directory, where there's a list of plant of retailers that sell native plant material. Not all of it is seed, um, but some of it is. There is also a great online resource offered by the Xerces Society called the, their native milkweed finder. So um, you can find it regionally using that um, online tool. If you choose to, um, I and I, we of course encourage it to re responsibly collect your own. So there's, it's easy to stay local when you're collecting your own. Um, so you can collect from your home or school or school garden. If you choose to uh, collect on public or private land, you want to make sure to do so with permission. So based on the Indiana Native Seed Community rules um, or guidance, their practices recommend no more than 5% seed from wild plants. So if you're collecting native milkweeds, that would be one out of every 20 pod, for example. Um, so you for milkweed pods specifically, just a quick tip, uh, people have done the opposite. So I'm just reminding you when you have schools or other groups collecting, make sure to tell them to wait until the pod opens easily at, at, at a touch um, along the seam. One of the cues you can use is that it's just starting to turn yellow or brown. When you do collect, it is a good idea to clean it as soon as you can. Otherwise it might get um, various diseases, uh, post-harvest diseases or Maybe there's insects in there that continue to eat the seed because um, there are a lot of insects that eat that seed. So you want to remove the fluff and other chaff and store it in what I recommend is a paper bag or an envelope and putting that into a cool, dark, dry spot until you're ready to consider stratification or sowing. 
And again, label with that species name and also the date of your collection. Um, so cleaning milkweed seed by hand is fairly easy. Um, I'm gonna run a little bit short on time, so I probably won't cover that but um, in too much detail, but you're gonna wanna, when you pry it out of the pod, you're gonna hold onto the seed mass by the silky end and use your finger to kind of flick the seed off into a container. The bag method is fun for schools where you can put the seed and fluff all into a bag with some coins, shake it gently, and those coins help agitate it to separate the, the, the fluff from the seeds. And then you cut a small hole at the bottom and kind of shake or pour the seeds out. So seed stratification, as we've learned, um, many of our native plants require it. Uh, it's usually a cold period, often a cold moist period. Most of the made of milk weed seeds that I know of uh, here in Indiana require that 30 day period of cold. You can simulate this by mixing seed with sand or perlite and just enough water to hold that mixture together and then seal it in a container and um, refrigerate it. So you wanna put it in the refrigerator, not the freezer, and put the date that you sowed it or uh, stratified it and the date that it, um, that 30 day mark date on there as well. Uh, so frost sowing, we, we're gonna mirror those natural conditions by sowing in various types of containers and keeping them outside over winter. Uh, here at Sycamore, we've built these wonderful propagation frames. I can take no credit it is the work of our amazing land steward, Chris Fox, um, but they offer barriers to keep out wildlife, but allow in moisture and light. Um, we also have been reusing clear plastic containers like one gallon jugs with a handle and a narrow opening. Um, and these act as mini greenhouses and then also protect the seed and the seedlings from curious critters. When I sew with groups, I try to split it up into two day activities. Um, so there's a day one for sewing, and that happens in December through March, and a day two for transplanting. So that happens April through June. Um, and you may have to stratify seed ahead of time if you sew late. Uh, so if you sew into March, you would be stratifying it ahead of time. Um, and you'll have to do a lot of preparation uh, of materials and collection of materials. Uh, and you'll also wanna make sure to provide care instructions if, you're, if these seedlings are outside of your care. So I provided a lot of them here. So um, I will go into detail. So day one, sewing. Um, you wanna gather your supplies. You're gonna gather one, gal one gallon jugs. Ideally, you're gonna reuse them. Um, you need a grow mix or some sort of quality potting soil. You may want sand. You definitely need a large bin for soil. You, if you're sowing inside, especially tarps, tablecloths, or trays are great for easy cleanup. Um, you might want a box knife and scissors. Uh, a drill is really handy and water, waterproof water writing materials. And Trowels, scoops, cups, spoons, gloves. Uh, these are all things you might want to consider and a watering can with a shower nozzle. Um, if you're going to be using sharp utensils, you may decide to make sure to prep before you invite little kids to work with your sewing supplies. Um, to prepare your jugs, you want to cut a line horizontally about four inches from the bottom. Um, you want to leave about an inch at the hinge uncut and you're going to take that cap off and then you're going to drill if you or cut holes in the bottom for drainage. And for the soil setup, again, put down those tarps or tablecloths. You're going to mix enough, um, you mix soil with enough water to moisten it fully. And then I use cups or scoops to help um, move that soil into jugs. For large groups, uh, I tend to separate the soil station from the seed sowing station. But for smaller groups, you could consider combining it. So for sowing setup uh, on a separate location, ideally you again may put down coverings for the table or tarp 
put out your seed with appropriate sized spoons. And then you may uh, premix tiny seed and sand of avoid over sowing. And then preparing containers of soil or sand for covering seed if it needs it. Uh, and then I also provide plant information for education and then also labeling supplies. So at the soil station, you'll have groups take turns or um, working individually to fill up their uh, jugs. You'll have them tamp down the soil. Um, I usually use the bottom of the cup to tamp it down. This is to level that soil surface and remove air pockets. Um, they can also tamp it down with their hands. Um, you want to make sure at the sowing station to keep seeds separated by species. So one species per jug. Uh, and then you can adapt spoon size to match the amount of seed needed. So if you want to make sure not to over sow, you might have a smaller spoon. I use measuring cups and measuring spoons quite a bit for that. Uh, you want to make the, sure they sprinkle that seed evenly across the soil surface. And um, if it's a milkweed seed, it needs to be covered with a layer uniformly of sand or soil, I, roughly a quarter inch thick, just making sure you don't see any of the seed below. For a very tiny seed, again, we just surface sow. Uh, so next steps, a label, label, label. <laughs> so we label with a common name. I know we're getting short on time. Um, tape the jugs shut and you put them outside in an area where they can get cold sun and precipitation. Uh, you want to make sure that spot has good drainage. And then you may have to secure the jugs so they don't blow away. That happened once. So in between the two days um, during winter, you're only going to water if there's a lack of precipitation. Um, however, when they germinate, you do want to water them uh, just to keep them healthy and growing, but not too much. Too much water is a bad thing as well. And then you'll open up containers on warm days, but close again at night until the chance of frost has passed. And watering. <laughs> so day two, transplanting. Um, it's, a, it's another station situation, and I'll go through this quickly and then try to wrap up. Um, so gathering supplies, your seedlings are essentially ready once they have four true leaves, they're ready to transplant. Some of these have more than two leaves, but it is what it is. Um, you also want to try to collect pots for reuse, uh, or you can purchase them. You'll need more moist soil and a soil bin, and then a lot of the same other tools one other thing you will need um, in addition to what we talked about before are sticks or widger tools to help put make holes in the soil and to separate seedlings from that um, their other fellow seedlings. So um, yeah, sorry, moving too far fast. So again, taking turns in that soil station, using cups, um, having them tamp that soil down to help make the soil level, remove pocket air pockets, and prevent water from flowing over the edge when they're watered. Um, and you're gonna gently, at the planting station, help them, help people separate plants. So it a, takes a gentle and expert touch. The more experience you have, the better. Um, you can use a stick, a dowel rod, or a widger tool, or even your finger to make a hole in the soil. Um, and you carefully, carefully hold the leaves by their roots, um, or their, by their leaves or their roots rather than the base of the stem. When I have um, young people hold young plants, I remind them that it's very delicate, maybe uh, as delicate as it would be if you were holding a butterfly. So, uh, and you might need to help them ease the roots into the hole and then tuck in the soil around them gently and water gently. Uh, so final tip, steps, again, label your plant with a common name and species name, water it regularly, both before and after planting. Um, theoretically, if all goes well, within about a month, they should be ready to be out planted outside. It never hurts to wait a little bit longer if you have time. 
Um, when you're planting, you need to make sure you use your species information to find a forever home that's well suited to the requirements that, of the plant that you're growing. And when possible, planting um, plants of the same species in, the, in groups for the most benefits. Not only is it visually appealing, but it's the most benefits to pollinators and other insects. Um, oh, so you can also give your plants a nickname. I sometimes encourage that. <laughs> um, and some schools that I've worked with have gotten creative where they grow plants each year. We're going to do it again this year and host a plant sale during their spring event as a fundraiser. And they kindly enough made a donation to Sycamore Land Trust with some funds that they raised. Uh, and it's just a wonderful opportunity planting milkweeds and other natives to witness all the wonders that your native plants will bring. So I'm uh, getting close on time, so I'm going to summarize. So since I started doing this particular program in 2022, I've worked with about 12 different schools and community groups. Um, I've hosted a thir over 30 of the growing activities, some of them day one, some of them day two. Sometimes I just have uh, the day two activity. If we didn't get a chance to sow the seed, I'll have seedlings they can transplant. I've um, kind of reached over 25 educators. So I've um, got some educators out there that know how to do this with their students. And it all told over 600 participants, um, 500 children, 100 adults. And I have no really great way of tracking the number of plants we've grown, but I estimate it to be uh, over a thousand. Um, and then my quick lesson learned, <laughs> I usually have this slide in every presentation I do about native plants, especially milkweeds. Uh, and then last year, I purchased seed from a reputable uh, and probably the most well-known native plant seller. And little did I know that they ran out of seed from butterfly milkweed. And um, they ordered it from a third party. Uh, the third party did not use scientific names in their... Um, uh, and, and, and I don't know how it happened, but, uh, I wouldn't, how that the seller, uh, or this buyer decided to buy seed without confirming the species name is beyond me, but, uh, I'm not the only one that received faulty seed, um, growers as big as, um, gardens on the East coast, um, also got the faulty seed. Um, we started realizing pretty early that this wasn't quite right. Uh, and, and learned that I had been sold tropical milkweed seed, which was quite easy to grow, um, but it is non-native. Uh, it's, it's becoming popular to grow because a lot of people are raising monarchs, but I just want to encourage you to reconsider growing tropical milkweed. Um, it, here in Indiana, it does stay later, green later in the growing season, which can confuse our monarchs that would normally migrate south. It might lure them into sticking around and maybe laying their eggs so that we would lose the reproductive output of any individuals affected. Um, in more temperate climates, it does harbor uh, OE protozoan parasite, which is um, negatively impacts monarchs and their reproduction. Uh, and we, we may see that um, climate change could worsen this act impact. All right, so we've reached the 10 minute point. So I'm gonna skip to the end. Um, I do have some resources uh, that um, as continuing education, um, but there's a lot of online information and it's easy to discover it. So I'm just kind of scrolling through quickly. Um, there's some great books for kids out there and tie in. Um, to summarize, uh, Sycamore will be hosting our second na annual native plant sale if you're in the Bloomington area. Uh, we are currently growing well over 100 species um, this year. Um, we'll see how many um, we end up for at the sale. Um, we grow most of our plants for our restorations, but the fundraiser plant sale um, helps um, us re reinvest in our native plant nursery activities. Um, so I encourage you to explore with Sycamore Land Trust. Check us out online. We have a lot of uh, ways to get involved and learn more about us. And um, just thank you all and give you my contact information since we had to get through this quickly because I, I tend to have too many slides. <laughs> so if I
if there are time for questions, I would be happy to answer them here. And thank you. Thanks, Mary. We really appreciate the presentation. A um, lot of great information. Um, I started my first uh, native seeds with uh, milkweed. I have found this the marsh or the swamp doesn't seem to live very many years, maybe three or four. So I almost call mm -hmm. it a short-lived perennial. Yeah. Uh, and I'm doing better as far as having a better progression of uh, milkweed because last year I did not have many monarchs because of that. So uh, I am going to try a couple of the others that you've recommended. So um, it'll be a, a good year. Yeah, I I've had that experience with swamp milkweed too, uh, especially if it's in a regular soil moisture setting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wasn't prepared for that. And I had uh, one year of great monarchs raise them, of course, as well, and um, let others be part of mother nature on their own. But um, last year it was uh, kind of dismal. So we'll see. Um, there haven't been a lot of questions throughout the presentation. Um, I don't know if you'll get a copy of the, uh, the comments. Um, someone did comment that there was a typo on the sweet Susan slide. Oh, so you might want to take you. a look at that. Thank you. Um, there was a comment and I will not even begin to pronounce, uh, but it, the Christine Johnson indicates she thought the eclipse, uh, uh, not even pronounced, was rolled into the uh, Poxinea, but that's not super important. So I guess it was more of a comment uh, on her part. Uh, oh, and the fa the plant family. Yeah, I, yes. maybe I need to update that information. Thank you for letting me know. And let's see. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like uh, you did such a fabulous job that um, there aren't questions. So you've covered <laughs> everything. Uh, let's see. Uh, cold stratification. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to cold stratify seeds and store them long term, or should they be used quickly, like putting them in the fridge uh, for the right amount of time, taking them out, and then storing them? So, yeah, I actually learned something uh, last year, which I think might be useful to the group. Um, it's growing butterfly milkweed <laughs> after the tropical milkweed fiasco, uh, I. Uh, wonderful uh, partner, Ellen J. Cart, loaned me some uh, butterfly milkweed seeds she'd had for multiple years. She kept it in a paper envelope and without any strat moisture stratification in her fridge. And we had really great germination. So um, it was multiple years old and it germinated well. So uh, that is a useful way to store it um, if it's in the fridge. Uh, I I would consider putting in a plastic bag, but I think she just had it in a paper envelope. Okay, so that's interesting. So I've put cold stratification and they are wet in the refrigerator and um, my eyes are always bigger than my stomach. And I you know, found that some were almost wanting to um, start sprouting. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I just put them in dry, that's, that's great because I do a lot of collecting and swapping. Yeah. I always still end up with a lot of- yeah. Of once Good. they are exposed to um, moisture, I think the time starts ticking because they're either going to start decaying or try to start sprouting. So, Right, right, exactly. Uh, there's been a couple uh, requests as far as a copy of, the, of your presentation. I do know that we, uh, with the recording, uh, we will post that on the Trello board and I have posted all the links to the native seed communities and Trello board but I don't know if they were looking for the actual presentation. Would it, if you are willing to do that, uh, that's, that's uh, your decision. Should they just email you with the request or how would you like? To yeah, I'd be happy to supply slides um, via email if you email me. Um, otherwise, if I could even make it into a PDF uh, for posting on the Trello board. Um, and oh, that would be great. That. Yep, great. happy um, to. And I'll make sure to make those cor corrections. I'm mortified that I didn't put the correct 
common, much less species name on purple dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. Uh, I've, I've, you know, you can look at a presentation uh, 25 <laughs> times and, and not catch things like that. So uh, that, that's, that's understandable. <laughs> Let's see, uh, share resources, and I'm not sure the resources, uh, Christine, if you were looking for resources that um, Mary was referring to, that would be part of her presentation. If there are others you were looking for, uh, let me know and we'll get those to you. Uh, comment, honey vine is attracting monarchs at our garden. Is this a viable plant? Yeah, honey vine is the non-Asclepius uh, milkweed relative that supports monarch butterflies. Um, it's not terribly showy uh, and it gets a lot of aphids on it, but it's uh, if you've got it, I'd say go for it. Uh, I'll admit when I worked uh, for a native plant nursery, we grew it and uh, not many people decided to purchase it. <laughs> yeah, I've had it grow actually wild, but I have heard that it's it doesn't always it's not the preferred if there's other milkweed around that they may you it may not necessarily be on it but um let's see do you have a good source to purchase native plant seeds and i think uh, you did yeah. mention that as yeah. the IMPS site yeah they have a lot of resources on there um i'll say currently this year i've made the choice to purchase um seeds for my programming from prairie nursery um based on some other people recommendations so yeah. so not prairie moon but prairie nursery prairie nursery yeah i i think i've actually used both um and i think they're both good but um uh some one may not have the seed and the other one might. <laughs> so I agree. It's good to check I agree. Yeah, yeah. Is butterfly weed good even though it doesn't have the white sap? Yeah, so it doesn't have the sap. Um, so it's it may have and it also has less amounts of those uh cardenolides. So it may not protect the caterpillars as much as other species of milkweed, but it is uh, a viable food source for those caterpillars. Okay, great. Well, I know we are at uh, the top of the hour, <laughs> and I think uh, Bill may want to come on and uh, wrap up real quickly and talk about um, our next pre uh, presenter. Thanks, Mary, again. Thank you so much for having me. It's been it's been a great audience. Uh, sorry, I went long. No problem. No problem. Uh, thanks so much, Mary and Deb. Thanks for first off uh, handling the questions. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, your step-by-step -step, uh, on how to work with the uh, the groups and everything. I, I think that's very helpful to those who uh, would like to do something similar. I did love your um, handle the seedlings like you would a butterfly. I thought that was really sweet. And that's very, very well done. You you do such a great job in working with, with uh, groups and with kids too. Uh, so let's go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, let me grab my notes again. By the way, I did share uh, DNR's list of uh, of seed sources in the chat. So, if anybody is interested in that, it's there. We should I, we have it on our website as well uh, under the um, well the Indiana Native Plant Society's website, and then the the drop down under seed, and you can get a lot of resources from there. Uh, and uh, Deb did share those, uh, share, I'm pretty sure, all those links um, th this evening. So uh, let's go ahead and wrap up now. If you have any additional questions uh, for Indiana Native Seed Communities, you can feel free to reach out to the links. Um, seed at indiananativeplants.org is how you can get us directly via email. Uh, we invite you to join us on Facebook on our Facebook group. We've got uh, nearly 2,600 people that are following and uh, some good information is shared there as well. Uh, we will be doing another presentation next month. Uh, it'll be on February the 19th, then it'll be Jillian Field, the Urban Green Space Outreach Coordinator for Bloomington's Parks and Recreation, and then Ray Major from Trees from Seed. Ray has been on here uh, a few times, and in fact, I see Ray is here, since he is here. Ray, would you like to talk really briefly about uh, what you all are planning to cover? 
I will, Bill. All right. Uh, uh, as you said, Monday, February the 19th, what is the hour? What time is that presentation? It's at 5.30 p.m. It's Eastern. Five, very good. 5.30 Eastern. I didn't have it in front of me. Uh, so uh, Jillian has entitled our presentation, Wildlife Corridor Growth Through Urban Green Space Outreach. And our uh, discussion points will be how within the Bloomington Park System, how we hope to increase habitat, uh, decrease mode areas, and promote native vegetation through invasive control and through direct seeding of native plants. Uh, this applies primarily to the Winslow Crestmont Wildlife Corridor. And this includes uh, direct seeding of uh, both trees and uh, native perennial herbs in, in that work. Great. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Ray, uh, Jillian and Ray. I, I look forward to that. So thanks again, Mary. Um, uh, and I also want to tell, uh, say thanks to Deb for, uh, for helping with the chat and, and security and all that that you do and the questions. Uh, so thanks much for being my backup as well for technical issues. It was good to see you all tonight. Uh, we'll sign off for now. Have fun growing natives from seed. Bye all. Thanks. <laughs>